All right, so here we're gonna study something called convolution. It plays a fundamental role in Fourier analysis. And before we know that, okay, if we have f multiplied by g, its coefficients will like non, not necessarily equals to the product of their Fourier coefficient, right? Like we know that this like almost never holds, like right? But when we introduce convolution, it has a good property such that when you convolute x and g, the convolution of x g is the uh, is the product of their coefficient. Okay, so this is a good property. So let's begin with a definition. So let f g be two pi periodic function on R. We define the convolution of f and g to be this integral. So it's a function of x. And it's defined to be integral like this. So f y and g x minus y. And you're integrating with respect to the variable y. Well, because f and g are integrable, so their product is also integrable. Okay? And a change of variable and using the fact that f times g is 2 pi periodic we we can have is also equal to this so f convoluting with g is equal to g convoluting with f right there's a g convoluting with f so it's commutative and convolutions is something like weighted averages if g is the constant function then f convoluted with g is like the average of f on the circle right you take all its output right its area and you divide by 2 pi it's like the weighted averages okay so why are we interested in convolutions though um so let sn be the Dirichlet kernel and the partial sum of the Fourier coefficient is going to be expressed like this a Fourier series, partial sum of Fourier series. And for this, we just expand. So we just substitute x in here. We're just doing direct substitution. And notice that we're with respect with y. So this is like a constant, so we can throw it in. So it yields this. And again, we can pull this 2 pi outside. And we use the linearity of integral, we can put this summation inside of here. Okay? And this thing inside, which is the convolution of f and the n partial Dirichlet kernel. And Dirichlet is defined to be like this, so you can make some observation that this is true. Okay? So to understand to understand the series, we only just need to understand the Dirichlet kernel because it's, it can be expressed as a convolution. If we study the kernel and we study the convolution, then we can just study the series, right? So it's like reducing problem to, we're making this problem, we transfer it into a different type of problem. And then when we solve that problem, we can solve our original problem. And this technique has been used a lot in a lot of area in mathematics or even in computer science. So here we have a first proposition. Um, Sorry, uh, proposition three point okay, here three point one is like the properties. So we're only going through the properties of here, we're, we're just going to prove all these properties, okay? So suppose the fgh are two pi periodic integrable functions, then we have it is distributive and the, the coefficient plays around freely and is commutative. So this is already proven, okay? And we have this is true. Yeah, this is also true. It's associative. And f convoluting g gives the continuous function. So f and g are only assumed to be integrable, right? And when you're taking their convolution, it gives you a continuous function. So um, it, it makes f and g 
it gives you a more regular function, right? Because integrable is like the weakest, it's like one of the weakest condition. And after integral is like uh, continuous, differentiable, continuously differentiable, smooth, infinitely differentiable. So it gets more and more regular, but so convolution can push integrable to continuous, okay? It can push to continuous. And we have this property, which is we talked about, okay? So the proof is that, so first part is calculate directly f convolution with f plus g, uh, g plus h, which is this, and we use our linearity, which gives the desired result. And second one, for any, uh, for any complex, right, which we just substitute in, we can pull this out, which gives you this. Well, this is c times c times f convoluting with g. And from here, notice that we have our change of variable, right? So we can put this c out again, which is f convoluting with cg. So one and two are proven. And, and three, we, so the, 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 all good. So we only want to prove the rest. So we prove six first. So for all these three, we're first assuming F, G, and H are continuous. Okay, we, it will, we will come to the case of only integrable later, but we just first prove it when they're all continuous. Okay, so assume they're all continuous. Then the convolution of, the co coefficient of the convolution, right, gives you this, right? You just substitute in. And you break this. This is the convolution you have, right? And what I did here is that notice that with respect to y, right? So we can put this in. So just throw it in. It gives this. Everything is unchanged. And because f and g, they are continuous. Okay, so their product is also continuous. Now, if you just view this as a single function, f, y, um, um, maybe f, f, x, y, right? So you have two variables here, f, x, y, and by Fubini's theorem, right, we can interchange the order of integration, if provided that <clears throat> your function is continuous, okay? I mean, this is also the function, right? So, <clears throat> like, their product is, of course, continuous. And, and we have, we change the order. Now, after we change the order, notice that, so, we can multiply by one here. So we put one, this side, we'll put it inside because we're integrating with respect to dx. It doesn't matter, right? And after here, this one and fy, they're all like irrelevant. So we can put all outside, which gives you here, right? And the rest stays inside. And notice that this is the Fourier coefficient of g. Right, so this is g n and this is a constant you pull it out the rest is equal to fn right which gives you the desired result okay and four we want to prove the associativity now g come with g come with h with x so x do this by definition and you expand this inside here. And now what you're gonna do is that, okay, I see. So it is, um, now this is irrelevant. We put it in and then we interchange DET and DY, right? Because they're all continuous. And we can pull FT outside, right? ft outside outside of dy right because we changed it and now from here we make a u substitution with a u equals to y minus t so thank god i've been practicing it and 
notice the, the variable here, it's just x minus t, right? So this thing inside is ft and the convolution of g of h with the variable x minus t. And now, well, this thing is again a convolution of f with g con d h, right? With respect to t, right? So, isn't that amazing? It's shocking, right? So, and five is that, okay, it gives you continuous function if f and g are continuous. So, we first we ask, we want to ask, this is what we want to estimate, right? So this is equal to this, okay? Now, because g is continuous on r, so it's continuous on any compact sets. And also, g is periodic, right? So if we restrict its, like, to negative pi to pi, g is continuous on this compact set, which is uniformly continuous. And g is also periodic, then it's uniformly continuous on its domain r, right? So we write out the, the condition of being uniform and continuous. So for any epsilon, there's a delta such that when s and t are delta close, well, which just gives you this, right? Then g, s, and g, t are epsilon close. Well, we're going to use this, right? Because this y cancels out. So when x1, x2 are delta close, then g of x1, g, x2 are epsilon close. <laughs> now we're trying to estimate this sum, right? We want to make sure that we want to show that this thing is less than like constant times epsilon, but no matter what. So, <clears throat> let's write it out, and we use the standard estimation here, and this is less than equal to, because these two are, you know, epsilon close. So, epsilon, we pull it out, gives you this, the thing rest is fy dy, and what is because f is bounded. Right? We assume it's bounded and it's 2 pi periodic. So f is bounded, so we get a bounded b. So we have something that is desired or as desired. So we have proven these three results by assuming that they're all continuous. But we want to prove something that's in like works with integrable functions, right? So to prove this, we need a lemma, which is lemma 3.2. So the statement is that, so f is an integrable on a circle and bounded by a constant b. Then we have a sequence of continuous functions on the circle such that it is uniformly bounded. So its supremum is, is also bounded by b for all k. And this integral goes to zero as k goes to infinity. Okay? So we get this. So we just first assume this is true. It will prove it later after we finish our own, uh, uh, finish our proof. Okay, so we just first take it and we use it. And suppose we have proven this one. Then for five, five, is that we want to show that what is five again? Uh, five is continuous. We want to prove the continuity of convolution. So we apply this to each f and g, right? Because they're integrable on a circle and bounded. The integral function should, like, you must be bounded to define define an integral. Okay. And it's 2 pi periodic. Then we have fk and gk. It's a continuous approximation. Now, this, so the, like the algebraic properties holds, like holds with any integrable function, right? So we can manipulate this algebra. We get something like this. You just expand it and see that, oh, they're the same. And we're going to estimate this one first. Okay, so this one is less than or equal to this. Okay, so we're using we're using this less than or equal to this. Okay, less than or equal to this, and 
because fk and f are periodic, right? So we can change the variable. We can change the variable to just y. And g is bounded, so we can, so we have this, and we have this. Now, by assumption, right, this goes to zero as k goes to infinity. This is a constant, and this thing goes to zero, right? So, <clears throat> so which means that it's also uniformly in x, it's independent with our input x, right? It's independent with our input x. Maybe let me add more extra brackets so to see, okay? It's independent of the variable x. So this goes to zero uniformly. So this is a, goes to the zero function. And similarly for this one. So for this one, right, we have the difference of g's and fk, right? And fk could also have the supremum because we have, this is true, right? So it also goes to zero uniformly, which means that, okay, these two goes to zero uniformly. And we can use the limit rules to conclude that this goes to zero, which means that we have this uniformly. So uniform convergence. And fk and gk are continuous. Remember, we have proven the result for continuous functions. fk and gk are continuous, and the convolution is continuous. And we have uniform uh, uniform convergence, which gives that the convolution of f and g are continuous, is continuous. Right. So now to prove six, what is six again? Six is. Okay, the formula. Okay, we want to prove the essential formula okay the essential formula is that okay so first let's just do some observations okay for hk being continuous such that hk uniformly converges to h then the difference of their coefficient which is less than equal to this now for any epsilon greater than zero we can pick a capital n such that we're using the condition of uniform convergence such that we have this is true. Well, which means that we have this true, right? Because if this becomes epsilon, we integrating, we divide by two pi, is two pi cancels out, right? We have this for large k. We have this for large k. Now, again, we got, um, we got hkn, goes to hn for every fixed integer as as k goes to infinity right as k goes to infinity okay so now back in our case we know that this converges to f and g right because we know that we have this uniform because we have uniform convergence here and they are continuous right so we have this right so just view, view this thing as hk right but we have the formula for continuous functions and now we have this also have this right now with that being said now we estimate this uh, limit right we're just trying to argue using the uniqueness of limit to conclude that this is true. So we estimate this. Well, we use a standard estimating technique. We add and subtract this so that we can factor it out. And we have triangle inequalities. Now for this, we know that each of them are bounded, right? And also g theta is bounded. So this thing's uh, this thing is gonna go go to zero, right? This thing goes zero as as k goes to infinity, right? Which is obvious right now, and we have this is true. Uniformly, but the limit is unique, right? Even function limits are unique, right? You can just argue by pointwise convergence. Pointwise convergence is essentially the limit of sequences, and for each input. 
right? The limit is unique, which means that for every input, your limit is unique, which means that for any input, you're converging to a unique function because, well, it is what it is. So we have f convoluting with g gives you this, right? Arguing the, this goes to this, and this goes to goes to this product. So limit is unique, we have this. <laughs> now it's so associative associativity formula. So since we have this result, right? Because they're continuous. And we have this, we just let this equal AK that converges uniformly to A. Now AK is continuous and AK is also bounded. Why? Because, well, we have this, right? Convolution is less than or equal to this triangle inequality. And we know that FK is bounded, right? And we have a change of variable because GK is periodic, right? We can change variable like this without changing the, the bound of the integral. And we can pull this again. Then we define G to be this, uh, we define G to be this constant, right? Boom, boom. So AK is also bounded. Well, if AK is also bounded, we can apply our argument. We can apply our argument here, right? Okay, so we can copy our argument, yeah, to conclude that this goes to AH uniformly. And similarly for this side of the equation, and finish to proof our argument that the limit is unique. And as desired, we have proven our whole thing. But the lemma, okay? So we're gonna prove the lemma now. We first assume that f is real valued. And you will see that if f is complex valued, we just work with its real part and imaginary part separately, we still get the same result. Okay, so for any epsilon, we pick a partition such that it's upper sum, lower sum differed by epsilon because f is integrable. Now we define f star to be the supremum of, it's like a step function, right? So for each, for each sub interval, we define f star x to be the supremum of f in the interval, right? So you have, if you have this, right, it's going to be like this, this, and this, right? Something like that. It's the supremum. And by construction, we know this is less than b, right? And also, the upper sum of f star minus f, right? We write out by definition. And notice that this is really just the upper sum of f minus the lower sum of f, right? Because when you're considering the supremum of differences, the supremum of such difference is when you're taking the supremum of this is f star x minus the infimum of f for x is n. This is the supremum of this difference, okay? If you don't believe me, prove it on your own. Okay, left as an exercise. So you got this. Right, it's, which is, right, the supremum subtracted infima. The supremum of this is this minus infima. Well, this is really just the upper sum subtracted lower sum of f, right, with respect to this partition. And it's less than epsilon, but, and the lower sum is the infima. So it gets the, the infima of this is when f is, when the infima of, of this is equal to f star x minus f star x. Okay, if you don't believe me, prove it, which is equal to zero. So this subtract this is again less than epsilon, right? Well, of course it's integrable, okay? And it's less than equal to this, which is less than epsilon. So we got our first equation, right? Which is, well, the absolute value sign, we're gonna use it for triangle inequality at the last 
part. But they are the same because no matter what, you're always, this is the upper bound, right? And it's less than epsilon. Now we define g tilde as follow. So for negative pi zero and with pi is equal to zero. And so here we have our f star, right? And our f tilde is gonna be like, okay, for every each fixed x2, right? We can pick a little epsilon neighborhood, a little delta neighborhood. So that f tilde is gonna be, so here's zero. And for this delta neighborhood, we, we adjoin them, which is a linear function, okay? So for any delta neighborhood here, and this delta neighborhood here of around x2, we connect them, right? So this is this is f ha, uh, f star, and this is f tilde. So this construction makes f tilde to be continuous, right? It's continuous right now because this step function is not continuous, obviously. But this makes it into continuous by adjoining this. Well, to make well when delta is like smaller and smaller and smaller, right? We'll see what's going on. And we know that f tilde can be extended to a two pi periodic function so that and also we have this like our construction, right? And f tilde and f star are only different in n intervals of length two delta, right? So if you evaluate its integral directly, so just like using ac plus cb equals to ab, right? So you just evaluate the integral from here to here, here to here. So you evaluate the integral of this, and you evaluate the integral of this, and you evaluate the integral of this, this, this. But all these like left out intervals is equal to zero. And for those, right, we're going to use that, use the fact that they are less than equal to 2b, and we conclude that there are n of them, and the length is 2 delta, so we have this is true. Okay? And we can make delta sufficiently small such that this thing is, is less than epsilon. So here, here we have gonna use our triangle inequality, right? We use our triangle inequality, we got, this is true, less than two epsilon. The F star is like canceled out. Now, we're getting close, we're getting really close. So for each K, we let fk is the f tilde correspond to epsilon equal to 1 over 2k. Okay, so whenever, so for k is the 1, so when epsilon is 1 over 2, we got this construction of this, for this corresponding epsilon. So then we have, this is true, right? So 2 epsilon, so you do some simple algebra, you move 2 over here, then 1 over k, right? This is true, and we take k goes to infinity, we're done. Okay. This thing goes to zero. As desired. We got a sequence of continuous function on a circle and they're all bounded for sure. And we have this go to zero. Okay, so this concludes um, our first glance of convolutions. Okay, so for the next one we're gonna Focus on good kernels.